This section of the book is on calculating volumes of solids that are sitting in space using integration. Like a, like a lot of the topics in applications of integration, we would be able to do better, more, well, better, more general examples in uh, multivariable calculus. We have calculus with many functions of many variables. But still, even though this is single variable calculus, where, where our functions are just like functions of x, we can handle lots of interesting examples of calculating volumes. So let's just, the, suppose you've got some solid. I'm drawing something arbitrarily weird, but we won't handle something like this. It's just to make a point. So you've got some solid object sitting in, in space. And it's set up a coordinate axis. Or suppose you've got a coordinate axis. And I'll just call it x, but it doesn't matter. And somehow, and we're going to look at some examples of how, but somehow, you know that the cross-sectional area, when you take cross-sections perpendicular to this axis, so when you take planes that are perpendicular to this axis that you've picked, you know the area of the cross-section that it slices out of your solid. So you're at some x-coordinate x, and we're assuming that for each x-coordinate between Say this end of the solid is at A, this end is at B. And we're assuming for every x coordinate between A and B, if you take a plane perpendicular to this axis and look at where it slices the solid, that you know the area of this cross sectional slice. A of x equals the area of the x cross section of your solid. All right, suppose you have that data. Um, the question is, then how would you get the volume? And the answer, thinking infinitesimally, is that you just you fatten this up a little bit. You take an infinitesimal change in x, or really you take Riemann sums where you partition the interval from a to b up into lots of things. But thinking infinitesimally, we, we take a small change in x, and we take that cross-sectional area, and then we fatten it up a little bit by that infinitesimal change in x. I am not trying to draw the cross sections as though they're all circles or disks. Um, so you get some thickened, thickened cross sectional slice. It has some volume, namely some infinitesimal little volume, dv. Infinitesimal volume. And it's infinitesimal volume. That's actually a really bad picture. Um, it's infinitesimal volume is just the area times this thickness, this dx. So it's just a of x times dx. And of course, to find the total volume, what you want to do is take a continuous sum of all of those infinitesimal volumes as x goes over all the coordinates, the x-coordinates of your solid. So this means you want to take the integral from a to b of a of x dx. Great. So that's what you do. You, uh, you look at cross-sectional slices, which I seem to have drawn all as circles. <laughs> it's easiest. You thicken them up a little bit. And you get ax times dx for the infinitesimal volume, and then you add those up. Great. So that's what you do. So let's look at, let's go ahead and look at a fairly, I don't know, complicated, but not so complicated, but interesting example where you may know this formula from geometry. You may not. Um, 
Let's take a rectangle that's sitting at some specific height. So I'm going to call this the z-axis, the x-axis down here, and the y-axis here, although I won't really use anything except z. Suppose I've got some rectangle that's sitting at a fixed height, capital H. So that rectangle lies in the plane at z equals h. And then I connect that rectangle to the origin. So I, I take a look at, so I'm thinking this is filled in. And then I connect, I draw all the line segments connecting the points in this rectangle to the origin. So what you get is a pyramid that just happened, or a slanted pyramid that happens to be upside down. <coughs> Okay, let me, let's fix this picture so that it looks, I need to draw it more slanted so it doesn't, or, or maybe less slanted would be good, so it doesn't, we don't confuse the lines connecting it with the edges of the rectangle. All right, let's do this. We'll go with more slanted. Okay, so you've got this, okay, I got a little carried away. You've got this slanted pyramid that's also upside down. It's got a rectangular base, and then it's connected, its vertex is at the origin. That's just for ease of setting it up. Clearly, if we're finding volume, it doesn't matter which way it's oriented, so I've just oriented it the way I find most convenient. Um, I want, so the cross sections, if we take Z cross sections, so you fix a cross section at a particular Z coordinate, so fix a Z coordinate, take a, a plane perp a perpendicular to the Z axis, it will cut this in a rectangle that well, you probably have never talked about similar rectangles, but it looks like a rectangle that's similar to that one, to the, to the base. Okay, so this rectangle. And, um, yeah, let's give... Let's say the area of this base is B. All right. What we'd like is a formula for, for the area of this cross-sectional cross rectangle that I called similar to this rectangle that's the base. We need a formula in terms of Z for its area, and then we'll just integrate. How do you get, oh, this has X's in it, but it doesn't matter. We can use Z's. So how do you get such a formula? All right, well, let me, let me just say what's going to happen, and then we'll verify that it's true. But I claim is that A of Z, the area of the Z cross-section, is proportional to z squared. So proportional to means equals a constant times. So I claim it equals some constant times z squared. Why is, why is that true? Well, you actually use similar triangles so that but you have to use kind of two sets of similar triangles. So, for instance, let's call this side of the big rectangle, the, the base, let's call that L. It's some fixed number. But let's call the side of this cross-sectional rectangle that corresponds to that side, let's call that length L, little l of z. 
right? It changes with z. Well, I claim that from similar triangles, um, L of z is proportional to z, so that when z is 0, you get 0. When z is L, uh, sorry, when z is h, you get L. So you can figure out the proportionality constant. How do you see that L of z is proportional to z? The answer is you use similar triangles, but what similar triangles? Well, you have to use a couple of pairs of them. This would be a good exercise, but if you take say this triangle and then you take um, uh, this triangle all right these two triangles this big triangle here and this little triangle here are similar so the ratio of this length to this length but this length is z, this length is h, the ratio of this length to this length is the same as the ratio of this length to this length. All right, so the ratio of this to this, so z over h, is the same as the ratio of, I guess I'll give them names temporarily, a and call this short one a and the long one b. Oops, I already used A and B. Okay, not A and B. Uh, C and D. This would be C over D. Or I guess if I'm sticking with capital letters, C over capital D. Capital letters for these fixed lengths, little letters for the ones that change when Z changes. On the other hand, now that you've got, it's the ratio of, same as the ratio of this to this, that, by these similar triangles, if you look at this triangle, so one of the faces of the pyramid, and this triangle, those are similar triangles, and the ratio of this to this is the same as the ratio of this little L that we were after to this big L. So, what you see in the end, is that, yeah, the z over h equals little l over capital L, um, where I'll remind you capital L is what I called this side. So the point is that little l, which is a function of z, so you can ignore this intermediate one, little l of z, as a function of z is capital L, just multiply both sides by capital L, capital L over h times z. In particular, it's some constant times z. But you can do the same thing for this other dimension. That was this little l, but you can do the exact same thing for the width, and it too will be proportional to z. Um, and then when you multiply the length times the width, you get the area, and it'll be a constant times z times a constant times z. It'll be a constant times z squared. All right. In fact, you know, it's kind of a very believable principle if you believe in such things as similar rectangles, that rectangles have two dimensions, and if they're proportional, then that means the length and the width should be proportional, which should mean that the area is proportional to z squared. Anyway, now that we know the area is proportional to z squared, we can figure out the proportionality constant. It's true, it's just what I would call capital L times capital W, but that's the area of the base, which we call B. So, um, right, if we know that A of Z is proportional to Z squared, so equals some constant times Z squared, but we know that when Z is capital H, we get the area of the base, because right, the cross-section at height h is, has area b, that's what we called it, but that has to equal then k times h squared. So there's no question what the proportionality constant is. You just divide both sides by h squared and you get k is b over h squared. So our formula for the cross-sectional area is a of z equals b over h squared times z squared. 
And in general, in these problems where you're trying to find volumes by, by fattening up cross-sections, the, the typical problem is to f how, how do you find a formula for the cross-sectional area? Doing the integration, well, it's as hard as the functions are hard to integrate, but you know, the actual obtaining of this cross-sectional area formula is the hard part. Now the actual calculation of the volume is easy. The volume, we would integrate as z goes from 0 to h of a of z dz. So these thickened up cross-sectional slices, you add up all their infinitesimal little volumes, we get the integral from 0 to h of b over h squared, z squared dz. b and h are constants, so b over h squared is a constant. We can pull that out. Use the power rule on z squared. It's antiderivative, z cubed, or an antiderivative, z cubed over 3. And you evaluate as z goes from 0 to h. So you plug in h for z and subtract what you get at 0. At 0, you get 0. At h, you get b over h squared times h cubed over 3. And h squared cancels, and you're left with one-third of the area of the base times the height. So this is what we get for the volume. One-third the area of the base times the height. You may have memorized that as a formula for um, a cone. This kind of thing is called a cone. What do I mean, this kind of thing? I mean, you might think, uh, this is just a pyramid. Uh, yeah, maybe the formula for the volume of a pyramid is one-third the area of the base times the height, but it doesn't look like a cone. Cones are usually circular. Mathematicians have a very general concept of cone, and I do want to say why that's what you get, no matter what you start with up here. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and do that. So in general, the general definition of a cone So you take some region that's contained in some plane. For the sake of drawing it, I'll draw it at a fixed z coordinate, but it doesn't have to be the uh, z equals a fixed plane. But I take some, actually, I'll need to draw that bigger to do something I want to do in a second. All right, so suppose I've got the, and you're supposed to picture that, all again at height h. <coughs> so this is a this is called a plane region. It means it's contained in a plane. A plane region of area B. Thinking again base of area B. Okay, and then so this is what a general cone is. You take a plane region, you pick a point not in the same plane, so I'll pick it to be the origin. But you know, if you know, it's not going to matter that it's the origin. You could just think of this as any plane, and this is any point not in the same plane. And then you connect all the points in that region to <laughs> to um, you connect all the points in the region to the origin by line segments. And the solid that you get by looking at all those points is called a cone. So you call it the cone, the cone on this region with vertex, whatever that point is. So the cone on that region with vertex for us, the origin. And my, my claim is that the volume of a cone is always one-third the area of the base times the height. Where area of the base makes sense, height, it's the perpendicular distance from the plane. This is, we've said this is a plane region. So the height means the, the perpendicular distance, so the distance, from the point that's your vertex to the plane that contains your plane region. That's the height. And yeah, the volume of any cone is one-third the area of the base times the height. Why? Well, it's because what does it mean to calculate area? And this is, again, is kind of a multivariable calculus question. But 
you would break, to calculate the area of some curvy region like this, you break it up into little rectangles. It's, you know, it's a partitioning problem. You chop it up into lots of little rectangular pieces and you let your rectangles get smaller and smaller. But we just did the rectangle problem. Right? If you chop this up into lots of little rectangles, then the cone on each of those little rectangles is contained inside this more general cone. And every time you chop this up into little rectangles, you chop up the solid into these cones on rectangles. But we know that for that, for that rectangle, the cone is one-third the area of that times h, but you do that for each little chunk of each little ch area, uh, each little rectangle that you chop this into, which means that once you take the limit to get the area up here, the same limit gives you the volume down here, and what you end up with is one-third the area of the base times the height, because it breaks up into all these one-third the areas of the base times the height. So, Right. The volume of a general cone, one-third the area of the base times the height, the case you're probably most used to, and where you're most used to having it called a cone, is a right circular cone, where you start with a circle and the vertex, um, the vertex of your cone lies directly above the center of the circle. This is a, a right circular cone, but the formula for its volume one-third the area of the base times the height. Of course, you know, that's height h. The area of the base, well normally if it's a circle, the base would be specified by saying it's a circle of radius r. And yeah, you should know that the, the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared times h. But, you know, it's always one-third the area of the base times the height. All right, let's do something besides cones. Let's do Let's figure out the volume of a sphere. Now, <clears throat> for mathematicians, a sphere is actually the, the two-dimensional, kind of just the outside. It's not the solid thing. To talk about the solid thing, the region inside the sphere, mathematicians say a ball. I'll just talk about the region inside a sphere. So let's, let's take, so as our next example, let's take A sphere of radius a. I want to find a formula for the volume of a sphere. Clearly, it doesn't matter where I draw it, but where we think of it is sitting. But it's most convenient to set things up at the origin. So this is supposed to be a sphere of radius r centered at the origin. So sphere of radius r. You probably know a formula for the volume, but you probably don't know how you get it. So let's find the volume of this. Now, by symmetry, we'll just, we can just find the volume of the top half and double it. So we want to find the volume inside the sphere. If I don't say inside, that's what I mean every time. So let's find the volume inside the hemisphere, and then we'll just double it. OK, once again, I think this is most nicely set up and easiest to draw where you take z cross sections. So think of this as the z axis, and the cross sections are circles, or the cross sections of the, just like we say, ball instead of sphere for the solid thing. Mathematicians really say disk for the filled in circle, but the cross sections of the sphere are circles, and so cross-sectional area is the area of this disk, the inside of a circle. And the question is, how do you find, if you're at some z-coordinate, z, how do you find a formula for the area of that cross-section? We want, we want to know the area of this cross-section. Well, the cross-section is a circle. It would be enough to find a formula for this kind of, in fact, let me say this is a sphere of radius capital R to not confuse it with the little r that I'm about to write. Um, r of z, we'd like the radius of this circle that's at z coordinate z. Well, you have to think for a while, maybe. Um, here's z. How do you get a formula 
for the radius of that circle. Well, maybe after you think for a while, it occurs to you to draw this line segment from the origin out to where this radius is hitting the edge of the sphere, or hitting the sphere. But this is a sphere of radius. I changed it to capital R so I wouldn't get confused right now. This is capital R, but this is a right triangle, and this side's Z. So it's, we know from the Pythagorean theorem that Z squared plus R of Z squared, this squared plus this squared equals this squared. Solving for R of Z and using that it's greater than or equal to zero, we get R of Z is plus or minus, but R of Z is greater than or equal to zero. It's R squared minus Z squared. Great. So that's the radius of the cross-sectional circle at height z. So the area, a of z, it's a circle with this radius. So it's pi times r, r of z squared. Oh, well that's pi times r squared minus z squared. And again, that's the hard part of the problem. Finding Finding a formula for the cross-sectional area, now that we have that, actually finding the volume inside the hemisphere and then doubling it to get the volume of the sphere inside the sphere is easy. Right? So the volume inside the hemisphere This is, you would integrate as z goes from 0 up to r. So from 0 to r of the cross-sectional area times dz. This is the integral from 0 to r of pi times r squared minus z squared dz. Pi is a constant. You pull that out. And antiderivative, well, r squared is a constant, so you get r squared times z for an antiderivative there, minus an antiderivative of z squared, z cubed over 3. And you evaluate as z goes from 0 to r. When you plug in z as 0, you get 0. What, what do you get when you plug in r? We get pi times r cubed minus r cubed over 3. This is 3r cubed over 3 minus r cubed over 3. That's 2r cubed over 3. So we get 2 pi r cubed over 3. That was half. So the volume of the sphere, radius r, or inside volume, inside sphere of radius r equals twice that. So what most people learn is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Right, and that's why. OK, so that's the <coughs> how you really derive the volume of a sphere. OK, can we do anything else? Like, are we really just deriving all these formulas you should have learned in high school? Well, even if that were all we were doing, it would be, it's nice to know where those formulas come from. But it's not all we're doing. You can, you can do lots of other interesting, interestingly shaped regions. Um, so let's, let's look at the hemisphere, the inside of the hemisphere again. So suppose I take the inside of a circle of radius r, but just the part in the first quadrant. So here's. I take the inside of a circle, radius r, but just the part in the first quadrant. Well, you can think of a hemisphere as being swept out by this as you rotate this region around the y-axis. So if this is x and this is y, then what you can do is you can take this, or I guess in my other picture this would have been z, you take this region in the xz plane and you rotate it around the z-axis and you look at all the points it sweeps through. So all the points swept out as you do that, 
And it would, of course, give you a hemisphere as you sweep this, as you sweep this around. <laughs> You spin this around, and you look at all the points it passes through, and you get the hemisphere. This is called a solid of revolution. So a solid of revolution. You get it by revolving, rotating. I'm not going to distinguish between those words. Some plane region around some axis. So, it, but it doesn't have to be a figure we're, we're used to. So, for instance, let's take, let's take y equals x squared. Here's y equals x squared. And we'll take oh, x equals 1. So, take this line. Let's take this plane region and revolve it around the x-axis. What do you get? Well, some weird, curvy, pyramid-y looking thing. You take this and you sweep it around the x-axis, and the question is, what volume do you get? What's the volume of that weird, you know, if you look at it sideways, it looks like a curvy, conical, pyramid-y thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like a curvy cone. So what do you get? Well, we have to find formulas for cross-sectional area, and then we integrate. So let me draw this again without Here's y equals x squared. Here's the line where x equals 1. And what, so we're, we're rotating the interior, we're rotating this region around the x-axis. So you get, you get this weird conical, curvy conical thing. If you think about what happens though when you rotate just a line segment in here, What's happening is it rotates around and gives you a disk. And the radius, so a circle. The outside point gives you a circle, the inside is a disk. So you get, as you rotate that line segment around, you get this filled in circle that's the cross sectional area. In that respect, it's like what we do with the sphere. Right? We, we said, oh, each cross section is a disk. Or, inside of a circle, and we found a formula for the radius of that circle, and then we took, uh, so the cross-sectional area is pi r squared. Well, that's what you do in general, um, or you can do in general, for, for solids of revolution. Your whole point is to take cross-sections perpendicular to the, axis, uh, to the axis around which you're rotating, and then and then your cross-sections, by definition of a solid of revolution, your cross-sections will be the insides of circles. Um, so disk, and you find, so you find the area of each disk. So you get this cross-sectional disk. And we want to find its area, so we need to find its radius. But, um, but its radius is just this corresponding y-coordinate. So what's the radius as a function of your x-coordinate? So you're at some x-coordinate x. What's the radius as a function of your x-coordinate? Well, the radius is this right here, that distance. But that's the y-coordinate on the curve. So your radius of cross cross-sectional disk at x has radius, well, this y-coordinate, and that's x squared. So how do we find the volume of this solid of revolution? 
our cross-sectional area as a function of x is pi times the radius squared, where this is the radius at a particular x-coordinate. but The radius is x squared, so that's pi times x squared squared. That's pi times x to the fourth. And so the volume, we add up all those a bunch of infinitesimal chunks of volume, so ax times dx, as x goes from 0 to 1. So we let x go from 0 to 1. We take a of x dx. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of pi x to the fourth dx. You pull out the pi, integral of x to the fourth, you get x to the 5 over 5. You evaluate from 0 to 1. When you plug in 1, you get pi over 5. When you plug in 0, you get 0. So the answer is pi over 5. Units, well, we didn't have any units in the first place, but volume units, so cubic length. Um, so that's the volume. Um, right. Uh, I want to say one more thing about this before I look at another example. And that is we, when I first started talking about the cross-sectional area and then you thicken it up, Right, and that's how you can view this for solids of revolution. You, you find the cross-sectional, a cross-section is a disk, or in a minute it'll be something called a washer. And the cross-section is a disk, um, and then you fatten up the whole disk by multiplying by a dx. Right? So this is a little chunk of volume, dv. But for solids of revolution, it's kind of Helpful. It, it, this may not seem like it's anything different to you, but it's, uh, it'll be helpful in a minute when we talk about doing things by a different method. So, yeah, so what we were just talking about, what we've been looking at is you would kind of spin this line segment around, generate this cross-sectional disk, and then thicken the whole thing up. Well, that's clearly the same as thickening the line segment first, and getting a little infinitesimal rectangle, and then you spin that rectangle around and get the fattened up disk. Um, if that doesn't seem different to you, that's good. It, it should seem kind of the same, but in a, in a minute it's going to be relevant or look better to us that if we think of first thickening up to get a rectangle and then rotating instead of rotating and then thickening up to get a disk. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's, um, let's do another example where you have a hole in your region and so you don't exactly, well, you don't get disk for the cross section. So I want to do this one. So again, I'll take y equals x squared. I'll draw it a little fatter at the bottom or wider at the bottom. Here's y equals x squared. Now I'll take the line y equals x, and I want to take this region that's trapped in between, and I want to, to look at three different things. I want to rotate this around the x-axis, rotate it around the y-axis, and then rotate it around y equals 2, the line y equals 2 and um, see what you get for the volumes of those different solids of revolution. So first, let's, let's rotate this around the x-axis. All right. What do you get? Well, I don't know. You wouldn't call it much of, well, you wouldn't call it much of anything. But you get this region swept around the axis. Um, now, it's, now it's a cone minus some weird curvy cone from inside. You took it out. But I hope you can picture it. It's, it's a little hard to draw without obscuring what's here, but you just take this region and you sweep it around the x-axis and you get, well, like I said, it's hard to draw. But it isn't hard to draw the cross-sections. Um, what happens in a cross-section? So you take a cross-section perpendicular to the axis that you're rotating around. So it's one of the nice things about setting up math that even if you can't picture it, 
you can uh, still get the answer and, and sometimes you can picture enough. So what's happening in a cross section here? At a typical X, a cross sectional line segment in our original region looks like this. And the cross sectional area that you get is what you get if you sweep that line segment around. But there's this gap. So what do you get if you sweep a line segment around, but there's this gap? Well, you get something that the technical mathematical term is a, an annulus. But what most people call it in this context is a washer. You, it, you sweep this around, it'll give you one disk minus another disk. There'll be this disk missing from the center, but then there'll be this disk on the outside. So I've, I've drawn the inside disk a lot bigger here, but you get one disk, the outer disk, minus this inner disk, um, and then you fatten it up. So the, um, there are two radii here that are of interest, this inside radius. Actually, let me draw this bigger. There are two radii here that are of interest. There's an inside radius and an outside radius. So you've got So if you're at some x coordinate, you're sweeping this line segment around. Yeah, there's an inside radius right here, which I'll call little r. And there's an outside radius that I'll call big R. And when you sweep this around, what you get is one disk minus another disk. where this inside disk that's missing has radius little r, and the outside disk has radius big R. Well, so what's the area of the cross-sectional region? It's the area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle that's missing. It's pi r squared minus pi r squared, where one of those was a capital R and one was a little r. So you get this, and you can factor out a pi if you want, pi times the big radius squared minus the little radius squared. Um, and I'll say it again, this thing is usually called a washer instead of a disk once it's got a hole in it. Um, okay, there's a, there's a common mistake that people make here. I don't know why it's so common. Um, it, it's the area of one circle minus another circle for the cross-sectional area, pi times the radius squared minus pi times the radius squared. But people get carried away, and I'm not sure what they're thinking. This is absolutely, totally unequal to pi times the big radius minus the little radius squared. People make this mistake all the time and write this instead of this. Don't do that. It's awful. It's this. All right. So let's Let's look at the problem we had, the ins where we had y equals x squared and y equals x. How do you get a formula for the cross-sectional area? Well, it's pi times one radius squared times the other radius squared. I mean, <laughs> pi times one radius squared minus pi times the other radius squared. Um, actually, I'll just draw it here. Here we've got y equals x squared. and y equals x. Well, if this is all you're told, that it's kind of, we're rotating the region trapped inside these, by these two curves and we're rotating it around the x-axis, one thing you have to figure out is where they intersect. Um, so that you know you want to integrate as x goes from 0 to wherever. Well, to find out where they intersect, you set these two y-coordinates equal to each other. You get x squared equals x. So either x is 0, or you can divide both, or if x isn't 0, you can divide both sides by x and get x equals 1. 
Here they are intersecting at x equals 0. Here they intersect at x equals 1. Okay. Then, the, the little radius. The little radius as a function of x. Well, it's the y-coordinate on the parabola. It's the y-coordinate on y equals x squared. So in terms of x, it's x squared. What's the big radius? The big radius in this example is the y-coordinate on the line y equals x. If you want it as a function of x, it's just x. So the, the cross-sectional area a of x is pi times big R squared, so that's x squared, minus little r squared, so minus x to the fourth. And so to find the volume, you calculate the integral as x goes from 0 to 1 of pi times x squared minus x to the fourth dx. This is easy. I'll just leave it as an exercise, but that's the integral that you do. All right. What happens, what if you want to not rotate this around the x-axis, but you want to rotate it around the y-axis? So let's look at what changes. Actually, almost everything changes. So instead of rotating this region, trapped between the two curves, uh, they intersected when x is 1, so the y coordinate's also 1. Instead of rotating this around the x-axis, we can rotate it around the y-axis. You get a, a solid of revolution with a completely different shape. There's no reason for there to be any significant relation or any obvious relation between the volume that you get when you rotate around the x-axis versus the volume around the y-axis. Um, you know, you're thinking, rotate this around. So you should picture kind of this weird, it's like a, a, a bowl where someone removed this uh, right circular cone from the inside. It's a, um, and the question is, what kind of volume do you get from that? And so, what do you do? Well, now our integral will be in terms of y at each y-coordinate. At each y-coordinate, your cross-sections of the region that you're rotating are line segments. And you're rotating that line segment around, and of course you get a washer. You get you get a washer when you rotate that line segment around. Now the inside radius, the inside radius is here. The outside radius is here. And so we'll have a, a cross-sectional area that depends on y. It'll be pi times the big radius squared minus the little radius squared. But we need everything in terms of y now. So what is big R in terms of y? Big R is this distance. It is the x-coordinate, right? the distance from here out to this point. That is the x-coordinate on the curve, y equals x squared. We need it in terms of y. So it's the x-coordinate on this curve, so this equals x-coordinate. on y equals x squared. But we need that x coordinate in terms of y. So you solve this for y. So x is plus or minus the square root of y, but we're talking about this positive x, so this is the square root of y. Okay, right. this, because we're rotating around the y-axis, we need little changes we need we're going to have the integral of a of y dy we need
everything in terms of y, so we need this outer radius in terms of y. So when you're at some y-coordinate, what's this radius? It's the x-coordinate on that curve, which is the square root of y. And similarly, what's the little radius? The little radius is the x-coordinate on this curve. In terms of y, well that, that curve is, is a line. It's y equals x squared. So what's the x-coordinate as a function of y? It is just y. And so capital R squared is, is the square root of y squared. So this is just y minus r squared, which is y squared. And what you get for this volume of this solid of revolution is you would integrate as y goes from 0 to 1, a of y dy. And that So we get the volume is the integral from 0 to 1. a of y is pi times y minus y squared dy. I am going to go ahead and do this integral because I want to do it another way in a minute. So uh, what do you get? You factor out the y, you integrate uh, the pi, you integrate y and y squared, and so you get pi times power rule twice, y squared over 2 minus y cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 1. When you plug in 0, you get 0. When you plug in 1, you get a half minus a third. That's 3 6 minus 2 6. That's 1 6. We get pi over 6. All right. So that's what we get for the volume of that region. When you take the region trapped between y equals x squared and y equals x, and you rotate it around the y-axis, we're getting a volume that is pi over 6 cubic units. Let me record that somewhere because I want to do this a different way that is not by taking cross-sectional areas. And it's why I said it's nice to think of fattening starting with a rectangle and rotating that. So what's another way we could try to find the volume of a solid of revolution? The answer is you could take Instead of taking what amounts to cross-sections of your area and then rotating cross-sections of your area perpendicular to the axis of rotation, you can take them parallel. So this is called the shell. These are called cylindrical shells. And how does this go? So let's take the same problem that we just had, but we're going to deal with it in a different way. So here's y equals x squared. Here's y equals x. Here's 1. We rotated this around the y-axis. We, we rotated around the x-axis too, but um, I'm interested in doing this part again. And you sweep out this solid of revolution. When you do take cross sections, and so you do the, the washers, we used washers, it's you can take the, the region you started with, and instead of thinking of rotating it and then taking the cross section, you can think of taking the cross section in your area, so in your in this region that has some area, you can take a cross section of that, it's a line segment. And then you rotate that around, and it gives, you, um, it gives you a washer, and then you can thicken it. Or, as I said, what you can do is you can think of it, not that this is any different, thicken it in the first place, and think of you have this rectangle of infinitesimal thickness, or well, I don't know what you want to call that, height or width, dy, and you rotate that around, and then you look at the infinitesimal little chunk of volume that you've got that's... So whether you rotate and thicken or thicken and rotate, you can look at it that way for solids of revolution. So, okay. But 
instead of taking a cross section perpendicular to the axis of rotation, what you could do is start with your initial area and take a cross section that's parallel to the axis that you're rotating around. This will not be the type of integral that we were doing before. It is not, oh, we know the cross-sectional area and cross-sections perpendicular to our axis. It is, this is something special for solids of revolution. So you can take a slice this way, and you can rotate that around. And if you rotate that around, you get a cylinder. You get a cylinder. And it has area. But then you think of thickening it up to get a little infinitesimal piece of volume. How do you thicken up that cylinder? Well, you thicken it up just a little bit this way. So you just give it a little thickness. It's like a, an aluminum can with no top and no bottom. Yet yeah, it has an infinitesimal little thickness. Um, but in your in your region that you start with, now I've got too much in the picture, but in your region that you started with, all you've done is instead of taking a line segment, you initially thicken it up to a rectangle, but with an infinitesimal thickness dx, you thicken it up to an infinitesimally thick rectangle and rotate that around. And then you add up all those volumes. Um, what is the volume, one of the infinitesimal volumes of a cylindrical shell. That's what this is called. It's a cylinder. When you rotate the line segment, when you give it the actual little thickness, we call it a cylindrical shell. A little chunk of volume. Okay, now you have to think. This is, if you call this the height, h, and you call its distance to the axis r, the area of a cylinder is 2 pi r h. So the area of the cylinder is 2 pi r h, but then you thickened it by multiplying by a dx. So this is now a little chunk of volume when you're using cylindrical shells. And you want to do this as you go through all of the little infinitesimal rectangles in your initial region. So as x goes from 0 to 1, <coughs> I want to emphasize you don't start over here at minus 1. You don't go from minus 1 to 1. You, when you calculate the area, uh, the area, the volume of a cylindrical shell, it's the entire shell that you get by rotating it around. This one is already giving you everything that's, that you get from rotating it around. I've just drawn this extra piece over here because I can't draw the entire 3D thing. So, yeah, you get this part over here from this part over here when you rotate it around. The integral you get is to, you just go from 0 to 1. You go over the entire area you started with, and that sweeps out the entire volume, which is what I'm drawing part of over here. Or I'm drawing a cross-section of it. So, with cylindrical shells, how do you get the volume? It, you get a completely different integral here. And the amazing thing <laughs> is... Even though the in-between steps look completely different, it's math. We better get the same thing. We will get pi over 6 again. So let's do it. Um, so let me draw some more stuff over here. So our thickness is dx. And we do this as x goes from 0 to 1. So we want everything in terms of x. So the volume is going to be all the, the sum of all these little chunks of volume as x goes from 0 to 1 of 2 pi r h dx. And what we have to figure out are the radius and the height in terms of x. So we have to figure out when we're at a particular x coordinate, what's between 0 and 1 what's the radius out to the rectangle, the infinitesimal rectangle we're looking at? This is kind of a crazy question. When we're, at, we're out here at x, what's the distance from here to this rectangle, uh, this radius? It's x. Right? So at least in this case, it's easy. r is x. 
And what's the height? The height is that y coordinate minus that y coordinate. This y coordinate is y equals x. This y coordinate is y equals x squared. And so what's this height, the height of the cylindrical shell? It's the top y coordinate minus the bottom one in terms of x. So it's x minus x squared. So h is x minus x squared. So what do we get for an integral? So we're integrating with respect to x now, not y. It's, um, even though we're rotating around the y-axis. You integrate from 0 to 1, 2 pi r h dx. You pull out the 2 pi. It's a constant. You integrate from 0 to 1. Uh, this is x squared minus x cubed dx. This is 2 pi times power rule twice. x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4, evaluated from 0 to 1. When x is 0, you get 0. When x is 1, you get a third minus a fourth. That's 4 twelfths minus 3 twelfths. That's 1 twelfth. 1 twelfth times 2, 1 sixth. Pi over 6. Yes. Math works again. Um, right. So you can use cylindrical shells, or you can use washers or disks. Um, it's a choice. In a minute, I'm going to... Uh, minute or so, I'm going to look at why you would pick one, and, or an example of why you would want to pick one instead of the other. There are lots of examples you can do with volumes, um, but before I do another example and compare kind of why you'd want to explain why you'd want to use shells versus washers or disks, um, I'd like to rotate around something other than the x or y axis just so we can see how that goes. So let's take... <laughs> You know, since it's so easy, let's take this same region, the one trapped between y equals x squared and y equals x, and rotate it around something other than the x or y axis, just to see how that changes things. So, we take the same old boring region trapped between y equals x and y equals x squared. This is y equals 1, x equals 1. But now, and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to be able to draw any other part of this because it's going to be off the top of the board. Let's go up to y equals 2 and rotate this around this axis. So we're rotating, so let me give this a name. Let's call this, um, call this A. I'm thinking area, even though I should think region. I don't want to call it R because we use that for a big radius. But let's take the region A. And we're rotating A around Y equals 2. So you take this, you rotate it around Y equals 2. It'll go way off the top of the board. It's, uh, I don't know what it is, it's some weird funnel-y thing. It's got a big hole in the middle. Once again, it's nice. We don't have to picture it to get the answer. So I'm going to do this by, both by washers and by cylindrical shells and make sure we get the same answer. So cylindric, uh, by washers, that's where you take cross sections perpendicular to the axis that you're rotating around. So it means that we take cross-sections perpendicular to y equals 2. That means that you can think of it as first you take the cross-section, so perpendicular to this line, so you get this line segment, and then you rotate that around and you get a washer. You get an annulus. You get one big disk minus another disk. And we don't need to picture it. We don't need to draw it. At a given x-coordinate, there's a big radius, but now you have to be a little careful. The big radius is the distance from here to here, so that's big R. And the little radius is the distance. There's a little radius that's the distance from here to here. Okay, so we still want Oh, 
Uh, a was a bad choice for the, yes. A is what we're using for area. Okay, we'll call this uh, region, strangely, we're going to call that region B for nothing except we're running out of letters that I like. Rotate B around Y equals two. Um, okay, so we want the area of the cross section at X. That's why I didn't want to use A for the region. Um, all right, well, we know it's a washer. So it's pi times the big radius squared minus the little radius squared. But we need the big and little radii in terms of x. So the question is, what's big r in terms of x? And what's little r in terms of x? And you, you have to think about it, or presumably you have to think about it. In terms of x, the big radius is this distance right here. What is that? Well, this big red distance is the distance all the way to the x-axis minus the y-coordinate on this curve. So this whole distance down to the x-axis is 2, because this is the line at y equals 2. This distance is 2, but we're missing that. So it's 2 minus the y-coordinate on this curve, but that curve is y equals x squared. So this is 2 minus x squared, right? Don't you know, don't memorize, oh, when I'm doing this kind of problem, it's this. Just think about it every time. You want this radius as a function of the x-coordinate, or this length. It is this entire length, which is 2, minus this part that's missing. The part that's missing is, is this length. That's the y-coordinate on this curve, which is y equals x squared. So you get 2 minus x squared. What's this length? Well, it's the whole length down to 2 minus the y-coordinate on that curve. And so it's 2 minus the y-coordinate on this curve. This is y equals x. It's just x. So this is 2 minus x. And so what do we get for our cross-sectional area formula for, the, for each washer? We get pi times the big radius squared, 2 minus x squared squared minus the little radius squared, 2 minus x squared. That's your formula for the cross-sectional area. And then to get the volume, you integrate with respect to x. Once again, it's as we go through our entire region that we're rotating, so just as x goes from 0 to 1. So we get 0 to 1, um, pi times 2 minus x squared squared minus 2 minus x squared dx. Let's go ahead and do this one so that we can compare it with what we'll get from cylindrical shells. Um, so what do you get? Uh, you pull out the pi. It's no big surprise. I'm going to go ahead and square both of these. So we get 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the fourth um, minus, all right, minus 4 minus 4x plus x squared. Don't let me screw this up. Yes, yes. Um, minus that dx. Uh, the 4s cancel. So we can neaten this up a little bit. Pi, we get integral from 0 to 1. There's a 4, there's a minus 4, so those cancel. There's a, a minus 4x squared and a minus x squared, so there's a minus 5x squared. There's a plus x to the fourth and then a plus 4x dx. Uh, we just use the power rule it's three times. You get x cubed over 3 plus x to the fifth over 5 plus 4x squared over 2, so just 2x squared. Evaluated from 0 to 1. I should say, before I finish this, <laughs> if you come out with something negative for the volume, you have done something wrong. So that better not happen. And if it does, then I'll, we'll have to go back and try to find what happened. But um, you plug in. 1, you subtract what you get at 0. At 0, you get 0. At 1, you get 
pi times minus 5 thirds plus a fifth plus 2. Uh, common denominator is fifteenths, so this is pi times um, minus 25 fifteenths plus 3 fifteenths plus 30 fifteenths. So we get 33, so we get 8 pi over 15. So that's what I'm getting for the volume. 8 pi over 15. Uh, 33, yes. Which is positive. That's good. Positive is good. All right. Let's do this by shells and see what we get. All right. By shells, the integrals will look integral. I don't know where integrals came from. So, we're rotating the same region around the same line, but now we're looking at it a completely different way. Instead of getting a collection of washers, we are, we are looking at y coordinates in our region. So y will go from 0 to 1. And for each y coordinate between 0 and 1, we look at this line segment, but thickened up a little bit to give us an infinitesimal rectangle. And when you sweep that around the line y equals 2, you get a cylindrical shell. And so what we, um, this little thickness, this little thickness is a dy. So what we're going to get is the volume, is the integral, is the y coordinate. Again, it's just as you go through the y coordinates in your region. So integral from 0 to 1. Cylindrical shell, 2 pi rh times the infinitesimal thickness is dy. And what we have to figure out is, in terms of y, what's this distance, so this is r, and what's this, what's this height, and so right now it looks like length because it's sideways, but we need to figure out r and h in terms of y. So, okay, what's this radius of the, our cylindrical shell? Well, again, you look at it as, well, this whole distance is 2, but then it's minus whatever y coordinate I'm at. I'm missing the, so it's 2 minus y. So r is 2 minus y. Okay, it's just this distance minus this, but this is just an arbitrary y coordinate between 0 and 1, whatever y is. But the question is what's, and now the question is what's this height? And we need it in terms of y. Well, what is it? It's that x coordinate. So the x-coordinate from here out to here, minus this x-coordinate. So it's the x-coordinate on this curve, y equals x squared, so minus the x-coordinate on the curve, y equals x. It's this x-coordinate minus this x-coordinate, but in terms of y. What's this x-coordinate on y equals x squared in terms of y? It's x equals the square root of y, like it was before. In terms of y, that x-coordinate is square root of y. In terms of y, this x-coordinate is just y, because it's y equals x. And so what we get is the height is this x-coordinate, which is the square root of y, minus this x-coordinate, which is just y. And so the integral that we have to do here is the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 pi times 2 minus y times the square root of y minus y dy. Now, this doesn't look anything like our x integral. I mean, it's got a pi in it. It goes from 0 to 1. But the, the integrand really looks completely different. And to integrate this, we're just going to have to multiply this out and use the power rule a bunch of times. I'm going to write the square root of y as y to the 1 half. And I, I do want to see that we once again get 8 pi over 15. Or if we didn't, I've made a mistake, and I'm about to erase the work, and we'll never find it. <laughs> um, but we better get the same answer. Or seriously, I just made some careless mistake, and I'll be annoyed. So we get, we pull out the 2 pi. You integrate from 0 to 1. 
you multiply out that other stuff. So we get a 2 y to the 1 half minus 2y minus y to the 3 halves plus y squared. Right? Looks nothing like what we had before. You do the power rule four times. So we get 2 times y to the 3 halves over 3 halves minus y squared minus y to the 5 halves over 5 halves plus y cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 1. When you plug in 0, you get 0. When you plug in 1, you get, all right, all the powers of y are 1, but then you invert this and multiply, so we get a 4 thirds. Um, minus 1, when that's 1, so but we invert this, minus 2 fifths plus a third. All right, so again, at least it's a good sign, our common denominator is 15 uh, Let me go ahead and take 4 thirds and 1 third, and well, uh, 4 thirds and 1 third, that'll give us 5 thirds. 5 thirds, and okay, everything in terms of 15 so this is 25 15 minus 15 15 minus 6 15 uh, This is 25 minus 21, so that's 4 15 times 2, 8 15 pi, yes, yes. <laughs> Not only does math work again, but apparently we made no careless mistakes. Um, so. This is how you can rotate different regions around different lines and um, use shells or the disk method. I would like to at least, maybe not do the calculation, but at least set up the integrals for um, a problem where you would definitely prefer shells over washers. Like, I don't know, this probably looked, washers probably looked easier here. Sometimes shells looks easier, but there are times when you definitely want to use one instead of the other. And I'll just set these up and then we'll stop. But so let's take a parabola that turns sideways. So I want x equals 2 minus y squared. And again, I'll pick on my old friend y equals x. So here's y equals x. But now I want to look at, that should have a vertex it. Okay. Now I want to look at this region, which I guess I'll call b again. <laughs> Just so I won't use any other bad letters. So let's take this region b. All right, um, we will need to know where these things occur. So for instance, where is this? Well, it's, you need the y coordinate to be zero, so that's at x equals two. Where do these intersect? Well, I set it up so that it's at x equals one, or at least I meant to, so let's check. For these to intersect, the y coordinates would have to be the same, or, um, or the x-coordinates would have to be the same. So let's put in y equals x. So if you put in y equals x, you get y needs to be 2 minus y squared. So that um, you get, put everything on one side, you get y squared plus y minus 2 equals 0. That factors as y plus 2 times y minus 1 equals 0. And so it happens when y is minus 2, but we are ignoring that one, and it happens when y is 1. So this y coordinate is 1, but there's the line y equals x, so the x coordinate's 1. Okay, so let's look at that region. It's got a straight line on two sides, straight lines on two sides, and a curve line on the other side. Suppose you rotate this around, rotate B around the x-axis.
Okay, so we rotate this around here. Would you prefer to use shells or washers to find the volume? All right, it won't even be washers here. If you rotate this around the x-axis, they'd be disks. Right? There's no hole in the middle because it's right up against the axis. So if you rotate the cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis would be disks. Um, the answer is probably you would prefer to use cylindrical shells. Why? Because if you use disks, then when you're at an x-coordinate between 0 and 1, your radius is determined by the curve y equals x, the radius of your disk. But once you pass 1, the radius of your curve is determined by x equals 2 minus y squared. So that you would need to split the integral up into two pieces, which isn't that bad. But you'd still have to do it. So to find the volume by disk, what you would have to do is take the integral from 0 to 1 of pi times the radius squared. That radius is a function of x, would be um, the y-coordinate on this curve, which is just x. So pi times the radius squared on that part. And then you'd have to add to that the integral from 1 to 2, so from here to here, of pi times this radius squared dx. And that's pi times what's this radius squared. Well, this is the y-coordinate on this curve right, in terms of x. So we need to solve for y in terms of x, put the y over there, the x over here. So that's y squared equals 2 minus x. So y is plus or minus, but we only care about the positive one um, in, in this region. Right, when you rotate it around, you get some y's at negative regions. But you know, be careful. Your, your limits of integration take you through the region you start with. You get those other parts by thinking of rotating. So our y-coordinates are always positive, the square root of 2 minus x. And so this y-coordinate is the square root of 2 minus x. That's the radius, but it's squared, so we get 2 minus x dx. All right, both of these integrals are easy. But in general, we don't like to split up integrals. Um, so could you do it with just one integral? Yes, if you did it with shells, you would just have one integral instead of having to split it up into two different pieces. Of course, these are easy pieces. So if, even if we just have one piece with shells, but it's hard, we'd still rather do this. But what would you get with shells? Well, with shells, your formula doesn't change. Because you're always looking at, you're always looking at, so now with shells, you take your region and you take a slice parallel to the axis that you're rotating around. And so you'd take that and you'd rotate that around and get one of these shells and you thicken it up infinitesimally in the y direction. So your radius would be here, your height is here, and you would integrate. Now it's your y-coordinate, it just goes from 0 to 1. You take 2 pi r h dy, a little y thickness, right? This is a little change in y, dy. And you get the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 pi, the radius, in terms of what y-coordinate you're at, because we need everything in terms of y, it is just your y-coordinate. And your height is this x-coordinate minus this x-coordinate in terms of y. What's this x-coordinate in terms of y? Oh, it's 2 minus y squared. So you get 2 minus y squared minus this x-coordinate. What's this x-coordinate in terms of y? Oh, it's just y. So instead, you could do this one integral instead of these two integrals. Now, all of it's easy, so you know, it doesn't really matter which you do. Um, finally, it is, I should say, if you rotate it around the y-axis, things would reverse which one you'd want to pick. I won't even bother setting up the integrals, but I do want to say this, that if you rotated that same region,
around the y-axis, so if you rotate around here, then it's shells that you'd have to break up into two cases. Because if you're rotating around the y-axis, when you're looking at cylindrical shells between 0 and 1, your height, your height would be determined by the y equals x curve. But when you get but when you're between 1 and 2, the formula for your height changes and you'd have to switch to the x equals 2 minus y squared curve. So you'd have to split up your integral. On the other hand, if you use washers when you're going around the, the y-axis, then you'd just be able to do this with one integral because at any given y-coordinate, you'd you'd have a washer and the inside radius would always be on y equals x and the outside radius would always be on x equals 2 minus y squared. So you could do, you could find the volume when you rotate around the y-axis with washers, with one integral. Um, on the other hand, if you use cylindrical shells, you'd have to break it up into two cases. So, um, but really, it's usually not much more difficult one way or the other. It's just a, a matter of choice. Um, right. I think we should stop here. <laughs>